I will call the remote hearing of the Local Government Division to order. Today is March 9th, 2022. Uh, this meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. And Josh, if you, if you would take the roll, please. Looks like Josh is not on yet, so I'll take the okay. roll, I guess. Um, okay, Chair, thank you. Chair Mason. Mason present. Uh, Vice Chair Elkins. Present. Uh, Lee Quam. Present. Represent Berg. Present. Represent Bolden. Present. Represent Hewitt. Present. Represent Mecklen. Present. Represent Olson. Present. Represent Joachim. Present. Okay, all members are here. Thank you so much. The next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. Uh, Representative Kwam, have you read the minutes? I would so move. Thank you. Is there any discussion or corrections? And if everybody would unmute, all those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Uh, there was any objections say nay. The minutes stand approved. Thank you. The first item that we have today is House File 3285. This bill was uh, referred to this division by the chair of the state government finance and elections committee. And members, I'm hoping that we can be voting on this bill by nine o'clock. I will move House File 3285 be recommended to be re-referred to the State Government Finance and Elections Committee. Representative Stan said, uh, do you want us to move the bill of uh, the uh, amendment first? Yes, please, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will move uh, the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape that the author would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Okay, Representative Stansted, to your bill, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and good morning, members. Um, I'm here to present House File 3285. This is a bill that would allow counties to advertise, sell, lease, or convey county owned property on a county website and allow them to solicit and accept bids through an online auction process. This is a bill that I've been uh, developing along with St. Louis County to help bring the process into a 21st century um, process. The bill also requires counties to advertise bids or proposals on the county website in addition to traditional notices in the newspaper. Additionally, the bill clarifies that proposals in addition to leases less than 15,000 for any single year can be negotiated and aren't subject to the competitive bid process under this law. Madam Chair, it's 2022 and we all conduct business online. Yes, even in government. And St. Louis County, a county that has conducted other sales online included tax forfeited uh, property auctions online and, has a, and, and they've had a much greater return in doing so. In addition to benefiting the counties, it will also increase convenience for members of the public who won't need to take time off of work to participate in an auction. And today with me, I have Director of Lands and Minerals from St. Louis County, Julie Marinucci. Okay, and if uh, your testifier would identify yourself for the record and please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. My name is Julie Marinucci. I am the Director of Lands and Minerals for St. Louis County and also the Land Commissioner. And I appreciate your time today to speak to this bill. Um, St. Louis County manages on the tax forfeited side just, just under a million acres of land. And over the last couple of years, we transitioned our land sale program to leveraging online uh, land sale platforms and we have had significant success. Uh, Representative Sandsteed uh, mentioned a couple of them, you know, 
our ability to uh, attract bidders from across the country has increased significantly. Our, our sales, online sale uh, going online has significantly increased. We, we sold over $4 million of property on the tax forfeited land sale things last year. Now in this past year, due to retirement, our department has now taken over the county fee portion, which is what this would cover. And it allows us to leverage the successes that we've seen on our land management for the tax forfeited trust. It allows us now to move the county fee land sales into those same type of platforms. So the changes that have been outlined would allow us to use, presently we use the public surplus website for the actual bidding but the, uh, the notification, the use of the county website for putting these materials out there um, would continue to be the same. And I, I stand for any questions and really appreciate, um, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for being with us. Are there any questions from members? Uh, Representative Meekland. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a question uh, to the author of the bill or perhaps her testifier. For those that don't have good access to internet, or you know, I have constituents that don't do internet at all, um, is there an option for them to submit a bid or be participate at the you know somewhere live at the auction while the bids are coming in? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, Madam Mayor, Chair. I need to oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, so that was a that was definitely a concern when we made the switch and timing timing was is when we moved to online land sales for the tax forfeited trust, it we happened to get it in place right before COVID really hit. And we were worried that we would have a lot of feedback that people didn't have the ability to bid online. Surprisingly, we have had no, no complaints or concerns about people not being able to, to bid. Um, once the online auction closes, it, these properties are available to be purchased over the counter and we would extend that same process, but we would work with folks to try and make sure that they know where they may be able to find internet access and be able to put in bids and those bids you can kind of just like any other online auction you can set sort of your max limits and it will automatically bid for you so there are mechanisms in place that will help with those situations where the internet might be a a hindrance to their ability to participate in the auction. Any response, Representative Micklin? No, thank you, Madam Chair. That's that's sufficient. Okay, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question um, regarding the online sales portion. We've had a number of individuals in in my area who have purchased these tax forfeited properties. They paid a hundred dollar bill to the county. They got them. They're in really rough shape, and they took some pictures of it and they threw it online and. One individual, I think he sold a property that he bought for hundred bucks. He sold it for 15,000 to someone from California. The person shows up and they realize that what they had purchased was nowhere near what they thought they had purchased. Uh, is there some manner of recourse? What happens if I was online, I was looking at your pictures and I, what I saw was not what you had posted on there or, or something. You know, When you walk into a house, you know if that tax worth of property is worth it or not. Um, is there some manner of recourse that you can go through if in fact it was not what was represented? Ms. Marinucci. Madam Chair, Representative, um, thank you for the question. You know, with the county fee sales, these are primarily going to be rural lands that we are unloading that maybe were secured at one time for a gravel pit that has been spent or was some piece of property that was secured for some other utility type work or use. On the tax forfeited land sales, absolutely, it is difficult to truly convey the condition of some of those properties, specifically when you get into structures. And you know, we really work hard to disclose as much information as we can and be as, as transparent as possible in ensuring that people understand what they are buying. We, we work to direct them to the local municipalities or zoning agents so that they know what can or can't be done with these properties. And so all of that information is provided and we really encourage people to do their due diligence and not you know, pick it up based off of uh, the picture in the right lighting that shows a piece of property that they might think is the gem that maybe is not. So, I mean, those are, those are, that's the work that we do on the front end to make sure that 
you know, we're not creating a situation where someone feels like they've been taken by their bidding on properties. Uh, response, uh, Representative Olson. Uh, no, thank you, Madam Chair. That, that was a, a sufficient answer. You know, I'm a huge proponent of uh, regular private citizens doing their own due diligence when regarding uh, business ventures. So thank you. Okay, Representative Kwam. Here, and um, I, I have concerns in that uh, it was mentioned by the testifier, well, we haven't gotten complaints. Uh, part of my concerns is if you don't know about it, then, you know, and you missed it, then you're not going to get a complaint. Um, and the notification and accessibility uh, from that, I, I, I think um, I'd like to see, you know, make sure that uh, the current law notification and getting the word out um, in non-online uh, um, fashion is, is present. Um, I'd also like to see, especially in the rural areas, that the neighboring property owners and the people in that area, uh, I personally think uh, they should be uh, notified and, and aware because, you know, one, uh, their their residents, citizens, and etc. Um, it can directly impact them, and they ought to at least know and have the opportunity to participate in that auction. So I like the idea of having it's online, but we have uh, this uh, room in the government center where you can come in and do the in-person, you know, bidding and etc. So. A, I know a lot of rural people uh, um, have spotty internet and uh, um, they might just be used to uh, doing it in person. So I, I think online is, is great, but I think you uh, need to have that option available. So information and, and notifying, um, the idea of uh, unintended uh, things being present when you buy online, um, you know, it, it, it could be a, a super, you know, somebody could have been dumping uh, old cars and other stuff on that property. It, you know, maybe it's a few acres. Um, it'd be nice in general to improve the sale of tax forfeited uh, properties by having some sort of component in the bill about if we discover that uh, uh, this site had uh, barrels of chemicals buried in it, um, you know, some sort of a, a, a clause, a Superfund clause that would uh, somewhat limit the exposure, um, you know, because once again, it's forfeited, it goes to the county or whatever government entity um, it behooves them to make sure that they uh, know what bad things might be there um, and, and, and have that informational. So it's, it's not just on the online thing. When anytime you touch a code or government process, you should look at how can we make it better and how can we uh, um, improve it, not just this little change but it, you're opening up a, uh, you know, a, a package or a recipe or something, um, and you have one intent. But as a legislator, it's always good to how else can we uh, improve it since we're opening up this piece of statute. So um, I like the intent. I just um, have a little bit of. Um, ill at ease on the notification, any clauses, plus how could we do it, improve other areas besides just putting it online? And, and I, I may have uh, discussions with the, the author offline um, you know, about this, but it's our opportunity to make multiple improvements if we can to this part of code. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Sandstead, do you want to take that? 
Yes, just I, I will. Um, Representative Quam, thank you for those comments. I do want to just point out again that what this bill is doing is opening it up to the online process, but not undoing the process that's already currently in place, which includes uh, notification in the newspaper for three weeks. So we're not taking that away. We're just we're we're going to an additional platform in terms of advertising and ability to to lead or uh, put in a bid. Um, and then on on your other point in terms of okay, so we're opening up the code and how can we you know, improve that? Absolutely, I would be happy to talk with you offline. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Marinucci, did you wanna make a response? I uh, Thank you, Madam okay? Chair, uh, Representative Quam. Um, one, the one clarification I would like to make in addition to what Representative Sansted had responded to would be the fact that I used the tax forfeited land trust as an example but to be clear that this is this is the change in the statute is applicable only to the county fee. So it is actually county owned lands that we would be selling. So from the standpoint that we have a lot better understanding of that property history, it's not like the tax forfeited trust where we get what we get and we have to try and figure and piece together the history on those lands. This is land that we have held for a period of time. It was purchased um, specifically for a, a road project or something. And now there's remnant pieces that can be returned back to private ownership. So the, that, that, what, that I guess I just wanted to make that one point that, you know, it's the tax forfeited trust definitely brings um, certain conditions on properties that are problematic and difficult and that the counties do spend a lot of time managing. But with this statute uh, governing the county fee, the county owned lands, um, that that risk is quite a bit lower in in the fact that we're going to discover something that was not known to us when we put it up for sale. Representative Quam, any response? Um, th thank you, Madam Chair. And, and part of the question about the notification was I wanted the public that might be listening to to have that information because uh, it it wasn't as uh, broadly touched on before. Um, did this is going to be globally for all counties, um, but would this open up uh, processes to cities? Yeah, I, and 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 I'll just uh, well, wait for the answer. And that that was the last thing I wanted to make sure. That it was clear, it's it's it would allow all counties to go through this process, and then two, um, what would prevent cities from duplicating uh, what we set forth here? Who would like to take that, Madam Chair? Do we have research available that could could answer that? I'm not sure on that answer. Madam Chair, this is Chelsea Griffin from House Research. Uh, Ms. Griffin, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, House File 3285 is amending a statute that's uh, specific to counties. Um, for cities, I'm not sure uh, offhand what statutes would need to be amended, um, but if you're interested in looking for a bill, Representative Quam, I, I would be happy to work with you on um, getting one drafted. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the bill? I'm not seeing any hands. So in that case, I will move House file or renew my motion that House file 3285 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the State Government Finance and Elections Committee. And Representative Stan said, I forgot to give you a chance to say your last words. Please go ahead and then I'll finish. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I appreciate you hearing this bill. I think this is just a, a very straightforward bill in helping modernize the process that St. Louis County and other counties would be able to use. Um, and I'd appreciate your support on this. Thank you. And Josh, if you would take the roll, please. Will do. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Representative Quam. Yes. Representative Bird. Aye. Representative Bolden. 
Golden, aye. Representative Hewitt. Aye. Representative Mecklen. Aye. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Joachim. Aye. We have nine ayes. Thank you. So the motion prevails. Representative Sands said you're on your way. And thank you again. Have a good day. And you, next, next, we're moving to House File 3588. And this bill, too, was referred to this division by the chair of the state government finance and elections committee. I'd like to uh, be voting on this bill by 930. And I will move that House File 3588 be recommended to be re-referred to the State Government Finance and Elections Committee. And Representative Vang has an author's amendment. Do you want me to do that amendment first? Representative yes, Vang? Please. Yes, okay. please, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I will move the A2 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author wants. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Oh, those opposed say no. Okay, the amendment is passed. <clears throat> and to your uh, bill, Representative Hang, as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, House File 3588 is uh, meant to be another tool in the toolbox to address how we can build uh, more affordable housing. Uh, one, it is easy to understand and use as, as well to bring significant uh, additional private capital into the financing of much needed newly constructed affordable housing. It does not require any uh, state funding. Uh, the program is completely discretionary for a city to use or not use on a project project by project basis and has a term of 10 to 20 years. It is not debt like, like tax uh, increment financing and therefore will not impact the city statutory debt limits. Uh, the program reduces the market rate assets valued uh, for a newly constructed building by 50% and the corresponding 50 reduction in the real estate taxes offsets the difference in rents between market rate and 60% AMI. 50% uh, of the newly created real estate taxes will still flow to cities, counties, and school districts like TIF, and it meets the but for requirements as these new buildings will not be built without this program. Um, it is not applicable for, to, to any existing property and cannot be used in conjunction with any other subsidy program such as 4D. It would significantly broaden the number of developers and investors that will be willing to develop and invest in affordable housing and thus really increase uh, the number of affordable housing units. Mm -hmm. so, um, it requires an annual compliance certification by the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. And uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I will yield the rest of my time to my testifier uh, who can um, give more context uh, for this bill. Mr. Duran, if you would identify yourself for the record, please and proceed. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Ke my name is Kelly Dorn. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to testify before the committee, and thank you, uh, Representative uh, 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 Bang, for uh, authoring the, the the bill. As I said, my name is Kelly Dorn. I'm a real estate developer. I've been involved in the business for 40 years. I have uh, developed and built uh, many millions of square feet of commercial property in the state of Minnesota and worth billions of dollars. Uh, I currently focus on multifamily. And we have built many thousands of units uh, of multifamily in Minnesota and elsewhere. I'm not here to represent uh, any group, and I'm not a lobbyist. Uh, I'm here to represent an idea. And the idea is how to increase the amount of available capital that will allow our society to meet the growing demand for affordable housing uh, and do it in a way that exercises and brings in that private capital to supplement limited government resources. Um, and it's time that we start actually providing these resources so that we can meet these goals uh, rather than just talking about it. There's simply not enough government funding at any level to meet the availability <clears throat> or demand for more affordable housing. You can fund more tax credits, you can fund more TIF, you can create more grants, but it just will not totally solve the problem. Uh, we need to extend the resources by bringing in private capital uh, into the market and to make the process simpler. Uh, the problem is the process today to finance affordable housing is just too complicated and too costly to participate. And that's why only a small percentage of real estate developers participate in the funding and construction of affordable housing. 
And it's, it's I estimate that it's probably less than 10% of the developers today participate in the development of affordable housing. Um, it, why is that? Because again, it's just too complicated. It takes many attorneys, consultants, lobbyists. It has significant additional property management requirements once the project is built. Um, if a developer wants to include say 20% of a project of units is affordable, uh, there's limited resources for that. The primary purpose or primary use of that is probably through a city issuing TIF, either a pay-as-go note or, or perhaps a bond, more likely a pay-as-you-go note. The gap in constructing affordable housing from a market rate unit to, for, to, to somebody who at 60% AMI from a funding stand, standpoint ranges between one hundred and fifty dollars and $200,000 per unit. And uh, the, the, uh, the primary tool that's currently available to do that is TIF. Uh, it, typically in these kind of mixed buildings, these buildings don't end up qualifying for tax credits or grants because those limited resources are, are more typically geared towards other projects that have more deeply affordable housing uh, or other uh, community goals. Um, and so that's the purpose of this bill. And we call it the affordable housing market value exclusion. And it's very simple. Uh, as, as Representative uh, Vang elaborated, it's very simple to use. It's very simple to understand. Uh, basically what it does is that the a city assessor or any assessor that's involved uh, values the building upon, com uh, upon completion at market rate as if every unit was a market rate apartment. And then simply that value that's established by the city assessor is cut in half. And the, the savings that results from that, from the taxes basically being cut in half as well, will result in allowing the property owner to retain that uh, from our, its operating expenses and to use that money to offset the difference in rents between a 60% AMI renter and a market rate renter. And the math works, and we've run many models on this. This is not a cure-all, however, for every problem. It's not going to solve every issue. It's not going to solve every component, it's an added tool as Representative uh, Vang uh, said. Uh, the purpose of it is it also is it's very discretionary. The city can elect to use this or not use it and they can elect to use it on one project or not, or not, or not use it on another project. And so it, the city retains control of it and the math is simple, you can test it, you can determine what the taxes likely will be generated by competitive properties in the area and you can determine if the, if, the, if the math works in terms of offsetting the rent differential to, to make that uh, policy decision as to whether to use the tool or not. It requires zero state funding uh, and, is, is, uh, uh, and it is monitored on, by based on an annual certification made to the, Min to the Minnesota uh, Housing Finance Board. Uh, this, in my opinion, I've been doing this a long, long time. This, in my opinion, will take people like me as a developer who I do not build affordable housing and turn us into affordable housing developers. It is easy for us to understand. It is easy for an investor to understand. It's easy for uh, a local policymaker to understand. And that, that ease and that ease of use uh, will, will, will allow this to become a catalyst for the construction of many thousands of new housing units. Most of these housing units would never get built absent a program like this because there simply isn't enough TIF or other financial tools available to create this type, this level of housing. This housing is revenue neutral from the revenue from the uh, from a developer's perspective, and so there's really no reason not to ask to participate in this, and uh, uh, it will create significant additional housing. And I'll leave it at that, and I'll open myself up to any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Uh, you had used TIF and M AMI, and I'm going to suggest that it might be helpful to identify uh, both of those. Uh, uh, yes, yes, entities. yes, ma'am. Yeah, T I use the word uh, TIF as an acronym for tax increment financing. Uh, AMI is a benchmark for determining, uh, it stands for adjusted median income. Uh, and there's different AMIs across the state, depending upon the, the, the local uh, income levels. And that's a, a, a benchmark to gauge affordability. And there are different levels of AMI. There are 30% AMI, 50% AMI, 60% AMI, and 80% AMI. Thank you very much. We have uh, at least one other testifier. So I'd like to hear the testifiers before uh, we take questions. Mr. Kropinski. 
Uh, good morning. I, I, I just I didn't say that right. I apologize. Identify yourself for the record, please. Good morning. My name is Mark Krupski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Vang. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, I am the Olmstead County Director of Property Records and Licensing. We oversee the property tax system. I'm also a member of the MWAO Legislative Committee. Olmstead County proactively supports affordable housing and has implemented its own 4D program in partnership with the City of Rochester. It accepts property owners who are willing to cap rental vouchers at 6% annually. We accept payment vouchers and we have a minimum enrollment period of 10 years. In essence, it is close to being offered with House File 38, 3588. In consultation with the Olmstead County HRA Director, Dave Dunn, we feel that there is not a need to offer another tool that duplicates what is already available. Existing 4D statute and proposed House File 38 both use 60% of the area medium income. Currently, 4D reduces that portion of the building's classification rate from 1.25% to 0.75, which is about a 40% reduction in the property tax. House file 3588 excludes 50% of the market value from the property taxes. Arguably, the exclusion may provide a slightly greater benefit, but is it significant enough to warrant another program that creates a property tax exemption that shifts property taxes to other property owners and further complicates an already complicated property tax system? House file 3588 does not provide for county input, yet requires that they administer the program, which will add costs to program for their software. House file 3588 does not align with the Minnesota Association of Assessing Offices position statement. Uh, points that uh, don't align, uh, we, uh, MWAO believes that adjustments to market values, such as limitations on assessors, estimated market values, acquisition values, deferment, exclusion, or exemptions create inequities among taxpayers. MWO supports good tax policy that treats all taxpayers in a consistent manner. MWO opposes classifications of programs that target only a small number of taxpayers. The most recent Minnesota Department of Revenue 4D report indicates that 4D housing units rose 5% from 2020 to 2021 and that it has risen over 34% in the past 10 years. This seems to indicate that 4D is providing a substantial affordable housing benefit and continues to expand. Properties enrolled in 4D receive a 40% reduction in their property taxes. I conclude that stating that Olmsted County considers affordable housing a priority, and we believe that the existing 4D program provides a substantial affordable benefit without further complicating the property tax system. And I just thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter today. Madam Chair, you're muted. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to testify on this before we go to questions? Okay, I am not seeing anyone. So members, are there any questions at this point? Okay. Uh, Representative Yu Joaquim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a quick question. I don't know if it'd be for the testifier, the representative or council. So I'll just throw it out there. Um, very familiar with the 4D property um, we, as the property tax division chair. And I know I believe this bill will eventually make its way over to taxes. With the 4D property, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the um, Lower classification rate is applied only to the units that are um, affordable. This seems to be a, an exclusion of 50% of the property value for the entire building, not just the properties that fit the 60% AMI. Am I correct in that? Who would like to take that? Madam Chair, I can try to answer that. Um, Proceed. My, my understanding of uh, 4D, it's predominantly focused on existing real estate uh, and keeping that real estate, those units affordable. Uh, this, is, this program is focused on newly constructed real estate. 
uh, is not applicable to any existing real estate, cannot be used for any existing real estate or remodeling of any existing real estate. It is newly constructed and, uh, and will create the volume of units that are needed to help solve this problem that although 4D contributes mightily towards that, it's, not, it's simply not enough. And I don't really think that this is actually that more, much more complicated. It's actually a very simple, straightforward system. Madam Chair, okay. thank you, Madam Chair. That didn't exactly answer my question, so I'll go to Mr. Swanson. Mr. Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Joachim, uh, Jared Swanson with House Research. Um, Representative Joachim, your, um, your description was, was correct. So the 4D classification um, applies only to the units that are, are meet the affordability requirements. Uh, this exclusion would apply that 50% market value exclusion to the entire property. Thank you. Representative Joachim. Madam Chair, I just wanted to make sure I understood that reading the bill. Very familiar with 4D property and it is also used with new um, construction. In fact, there's a big push to lower that first tier down to 0.75 for all property, not just the property that's valued at 100,000 as a compromise last year, we dropped that first tier back to 100,000 with the inflator that had been on it. It had gotten up to about 174,000. It was becoming prohibitive for um, developers to actually use it um, to develop property. So we're still in discussions on that, just had a report back. Um, as um, Mr. Krupski, and I am so sorry, I probably <laughs> pronounced that wrong, said it is a, a, a tax and tax rate that's used throughout our state and we're still trying to figure out how to amplify it. I understand this makes a lot, um, it's a lot easier to understand than TIF. We all know that tax increment financing can be very um, complicated and it kind of falls along that line a little bit more um, and maybe along the line of an abatement and was wondering if we'd heard from the counties being concerned that 50% of their pro the property would be off the tax rolls. One of the things we've also been talking about with the 4D property, and Ms. maybe Mr. Doran and I can talk about this offline, is how is that um, getting that tax benefit and making sure that the property stays affordable for the amount of tax benefit that's going into it is something that I'd be a little bit concerned about. Um, but thank you for bringing a very creative bill forward and anything we can do to get some tools in the toolbox or cities to help with affordable housing um, would be a good idea. And I wanna thank Mr. Doran for working with the cities. I know we have some letters in our packet saying that he has been, and I, I suggest people read those as well. There's still some hesitancy around it. So um, we'll work its way through the process. Thank you very much. And again, I just wanted to emphasize what uh, Representative Joachim uh, said, if you go to the local government division website, our agenda and all the written testimony is there for you to read as well. And uh, next I see Representative Kwam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, as was touched upon, uh, this affects more than just the city. Um, there's a county, it wasn't brought up the effect on uh, school districts. Um, and uh, it was, one of the testifiers mentioned, well, and the, the state is, isn't costing the state anything. Well, I know when we've made adjustments to property tax, I think it was when, when the ag was changed, there were some adjustments of where the state contributed a portion of, and I think that was on school, uh, a school levy or, or bond issue. Um, and I understand the intent. Uh, my concern is, uh, you know, the effect on schools, and uh, you know that there isn't doesn't appear to be anything to look at the schools, and then uh, doing something with counties in order to uh, uh, take care of the effects upon them. Uh, so I, I think it's not quite. Uh, there yet in its current form um, and there are some issues that need to be addressed and uh, you know I, I, I guess that uh, 
maybe the, the author could e explain how they're uh, planning to uh, uh, rectify the impact on counties and schools might be nice. Representative Van. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Quam, uh, as there will be a couple more committee stops and it is my intent to continue to engage with various stakeholders. Um, I know that um, a couple has reached out to me to express uh, some concerns and, and it's my intent to continue to work with them um, and see how we can continue to improve this bill. Um, that is the purpose of this committee process is continue to fine tune the bill to make sure that it meets the needs of, of all stakeholders. Madam Chair, could I add to that? Oh, Mr. Doring. Yeah, I, I would like to just add to that, that it, the, the assumption here is that a developer comes into a community with a proposed project that contains 20% uh, of the units at 60% AMI. Um, I am not aware of any significant use of 4D for any significantly sized projects uh, that I'm aware of uh, as a resource to make that project work. Um, what this project does currently, the, the opportunity for that type of project to get built to fund the gap in cost, the primary resource is TIF. Under TIF, all of the taxes would go towards the payment of the pay as you go note that's issued to the developer to cover the gap in financing. So school districts and counties do not participate in that process. In this process, only half of the taxes being generated uh, will go towards offsetting the rent differential. So the other half will continue to flow to cities, counties, and school districts. And thus the present value of this from a revenue stream standpoint is much greater than TIF over the life of a typical pay-as-you-go TIF note, which is 15 to 20 years. Um, and so there actually is a benefit. And in terms of a uh, transfer of this or an offset to this. Again, the assumption here is that these buildings don't get built without this program. And so the, the revenue that is generated at 50% is 50% more than would be there because these buildings wouldn't be there. And so I'm, uh, I'm not sure that there is the transfer issue. I'm not sure uh, that cities and counties don't benefit from this. Uh, and it does go towards creating a, a significant additional affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, and I will take uh, Mr. Krupski next. And I'm thinking here, that name was used in the song many years ago, wasn't there? That was my <laughs> uncle, Krupke. Officer Krupski. It was that a <laughs> story. <laughs> uh, if you'll proceed, so, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd just like to respond that uh, in the city of Rochester, we had a, an affordable housing champion who just recently passed his name, passed away. His name was Joseph Weiss, Weiss Construction. He was close to 90 and he built several, and I mean several properties that were 4D in Homestead County and in the city, mainly in the city of Rochester. So to Mr. Doran's point, uh, I would say that uh, that's not the case in, in Rochester. Uh, and the difference between 4D and this is that the 4D units, only the units that are in the program that are providing the benefit receive the reduced classification rate versus in this one, only 20% of the building has to. And we are not on apartments in Rochester. We've had, I mean, apartments have been the most resilient property type over the last, ever since, you know, last 20 years. I've been doing this for 32 years. And uh, by going with this route, uh, you're only really adding 20% of this improvement is gonna receive the benefit. Whereas with a 4D property, whatever, if 100% if of the building is in 4D, then 100% of the building gets the benefit. So I think there's a more direct relationship with 4D versus this legislation. And again, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to share once again. Thank you. And uh, Representative Quam, I think these were in response to your question. Any further comments? I, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, one, uh, uh, one of the testifiers seemed to indicate that, well, nothing would happen to the property uh, if they didn't al allow this. And, and frankly, a lot, you know, one part of the state, maybe that's true. 
I can uh, confirm along, you know, I, I'm sure the uh, Olmsted County testifier could confirm that there is, if we aren't building on, you know, that project on that land, um, something else is going to be built. And so it's not uh, what we're doing down here is trying to incentivize having the affordable housing built, but, uh, you know, construction and expansion, uh, the city I'm, I'm, I'm living in now grew 28% in the last census. So this rule isn't just going to be in effect for a city, a county, et cetera. This is statewide. Plus this committee is about local government. So waiting for the addressing of counties, uh, you know, the, the property packs part of, uh, and the impacts to schools and the citizens and uh, you know, our counties. I think this is a committee where we should have been able to uh, uh, discuss the uh, impacts of this on other uh, entities of local government. Uh, this is, you know, I, I hope that, I guess I can uh, trust the author will be uh, taking care of that issue, but I really wish that we could have addressed it in this local government, uh, um, you know, committee. Um, too often times we let a, ooh, ooh it's shiny, a, a, a wonderful idea, great intent, and we don't address all of the unintended or the ripple effects. And I think that's what a lot of the discussion in the ill at ease has been, not on the intent, but, um, have we appropriately addressed uh, the possibility? Have we f fleshed out the bill so that we don't have to worry about some impact? And, you know, plus always remembering uh, communities differ, counties differ, and we really have to make sure that uh, what's great for one part of the state uh, maybe is not uh, causing an issue in another part. So with that, I will, will eagerly uh, await further discussion on this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Representative Elkins, you're next, and then Representative Meekland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So a lot of the questions that I had or at least, at least been, been, been raised uh, just as a general rule in terms of uh, a tool for local government. I'm always strongly supportive of uh, incentives to create uh, mixed income housing. Uh, I think that it uh, uh, results in better integrated communities and uh, avoids the possibility of creating future um, concentrated areas of property. Um, this approach, as it's already been testified, uh, uh, does seem to have a substantial overlap uh, in terms of its effects, if not the exact mechanism with the 4D program. I think that when uh, the bill gets to uh, Chair Joachim's uh, committee. I think that those kinds of issues will be uh, much um, greater explored. But again, they, it's already been noted that um, uh, the, the credit would uh, apply to the entire building, not just the affordable units. Uh, and uh, the builder only has to make a, a good faith effort to make sure that 20% uh, of the units are um, uh, are you know actually rented by. Um, uh, people who meet the income levels that it's no not even a guarantee and in, in theory the way I'm reading the bill that uh, all of those units would actually be uh, um, occupied by people who meet those income requirements so I'm inclined to uh, vote for the bill to move it along to further the discussion but I do think that it's a bit uh, broad brush right now okay. thank you representative Meekland uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm not sure if this will be Representative Vang or uh, Mr. Duran, but there's a for this 20%, there's an income requirement upon entrance into the, the building. Is there something that verifies that that income stays at that level on an annual basis in the event they became prosperous or, you know, something changed in their income levels? I mean, or once they're in, it's guaranteed for the next 10 or 20 years. Would, Mr. Duran, did you want to respond? I'll be happy to, uh, Madam Chair. It, it does, the bill does provide for that the 60% AMI must be met at initial leasing. 
Uh, the annual cert certification does require that there be uh, an attempt made to keep it at that level, but yet we also want to balance the prospect of allowing people's incomes to grow. Uh, but keep in mind that the affordable units within these buildings are not restricted to particular units. They're restricted to 20% of the units. So there could be other people that could come into the building that would substitute in as the affordable aspect if someone's income does grow. Um, I don't think Limiting somebody's income is the way we want to go either. I think we want to encourage that growth of income uh, and to move forward. And uh, the annual certification to the Minnesota uh, Housing Authority, uh, Finance Authority would be uh, would required to, to show that on, a, on an overall basis. Representative Meeklin, any response? Um, no, I think that answered it for me. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from members? Uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you. That just brought up another question. I think is probably better for this committee, maybe than um, probably to our taxes. But if you know you when you recertify, let's say you have that twenty percent that has to be at the affordable sixty percent AMI, and what happens if you don't have any tenants that are applying to come in because the sixty percent AMI might still be out of reach for some folks? Do those 20 units then stay empty or are you able to um, rent them out to people that are above that income? I'm not sure. I, I know that the requalification every year is in the bill, but I wasn't sure how that would work if then you just end up having 20, you know, 20 percent of your units empty. And what's the average amount of empty units that are in a development? I'm sorry, I'm showing my ignorance on this. Thank you. Would like to take that. I'll be happy to answer that, Madam Chair. Mr. Duran. Uh, um, the bill provides that the, uh, well, let me, let me back up. The practical experience right now with almost every affordable housing unit at every affordable housing level is there's a waiting list uh, for them. Uh, and so something would dramatically have to change for that to, to be different. And that would, I guess that would be ultimately a good thing if that did change. Um, but so I, do, I doubt these units would stay empty very long um, and the units with are, are any unit within the building. So there's no discrimination on terms of building a particular unit or a particular way. It has to be any unit in the building and those units can move around uh, as people's incomes grow or not grow or the need changes. Maybe one year you might need more two bedrooms and one bedrooms. It just depends on what's available. Um, and so the, the, I think the language in, in with the amendment that we worked with, with the League of Cities is clear that the units have to be made available and, and stay available for those. And you cannot substitute in uh, a market rate apartment in, into one of those units. Thank you, Representative Joachim. No, oh, thank you. Members, is the, are there any more questions or discussion on the bill? Okay, not seeing any hands. Representative Ang, would you like to make some closing re remarks? Just want to say thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for considering this bill, and I appreciate the engaged discussion on this. And I uh, will work to address uh, some of the concerns made and and um, as we move through the committee process. Thank you. I will renew my mo motion that House File thirty five eighty eight be recommended to be re-referred to the State Government Finance and Elections Committee uh, as amended. And if the clerk would take the roll, please. Representative Mason? Mason, aye. Representative Elkins? Elkins, aye. Representative Quam? No. Representative Burt? Aye. Representative Bolden? Bolden, aye. Representative Hewitt. Aye. Representative Mecklen. No. Representative Olson. No. Representative Joachim. Aye. We have six ayes and three nays. Okay. The motion prevails. Representative Vang, you're on your way. Thank you so much. And next, we are moving to House File 
34. And this bill too was referred uh, to the division by the chair of the state government finance and elections committee. And uh, I'd like to take the vote by 955, please. Representative Elkins, uh, would you like to move your bill, please? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, we'll move that um, uh, House file, gosh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> caught me flat footed. What's the bill sorry. number? Okay, okay, uh, House file 3834. 3834 30. be moved to the, uh, uh, re referred to the state government uh, finance and elections committee. Exactly. Sorry. And uh, so to your bill, please. Um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, as described in the uh, the House uh, um, Research Bill summary, um, Bloomington and South St. Paul were um, you know, some of the first cities in the states to have um, housing and redevelopment authorities, and so uh, the the original authority uh, to create these was uh, placed in, in session law way back in uh, in 1971, uh, and. Um, uh, that that's the statutes that were uh, updated in 1977. Uh, and then in 1987, uh, the, the laws governing uh, housing and redevelopment authorities more generally were updated and re recodified uh, into a new section of, of law, but that um, uh, the, the special, the, the session law from 71 and 77 is still out there. And so the City of Bloomington um, would basically like to just clean up that that old um, session law, make it crystal clear uh, that Bloomington and South St. Paul um, are just governed by the, the general statute that uh, governs all HRAs um, uh, uh, statewide. So this is basically a kind of a, just a, an administrative cleanup. And uh, we have reached out through Representative uh, Rick Hansen and uh, uh, direct HRA to HRA contacts to uh, make sure that uh, there's nothing about this that uh, uh, the city of South St. Paul um, would be disadvantaged by. We haven't gotten back to them yet, but if they do find some reason why they wouldn't participate in this, we would offer a, an amendment to uh, remove them from this bill when the, when the bill gets to uh, state government finance. Okay, thank you. And you, I'm not seeing any testifiers for this bill. So members, are there any questions or discussion on this bill? You may be, this may be your lucky day. <laughs> this is a pretty simple administrative cleanup, uh, Madam Chair. So I'll re renew my motion that we refer this bill to the Committee on, uh, on State Government Finance and Elections. Okay, thank you so much. And if uh, Josh will take the roll, please. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Representative Plum. Representative Plum. Aye. Representative Bird. Aye. Representative Golden. Representative Bolden. Representative Hewitt. Aye. Representative Mecklen. Aye. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Joaquin. Aye. Representative Bolden. We have eight. Bolden, aye. Oh, nine eyes. Eyes. Would you repeat that, please? We have nine eyes. Okay, thank you very much. So the motion prevails, and Representative Elkins, you're on way, your way with your bill. Before, thank you, Madam Chair. You are welcome. Uh, before we adjourn, do members have any comments or discussion? Not seeing any, we stand adjourned. Have a good day. <laughs>